Start. Welcome to the last day of the in-person part of the conference. Um, yeah, the first one of them is this, and Alvin Chapman is the speaker. Please. Hey, great. Thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for coming to my talk today. Uh, my name is Adrian Chapman, um, and so this is work done by a student at the University of Sydney, together with myself at the University of Sydney and Stephen Flamia at Amazon. And uh, since then, I've moved to uh, University of Oxford. So, uh, right, so this is free fermions behind the disguise. And just one second. Okay. So, our goal is to simulate many body spin systems. Um, and a notorious challenge for doing this is uh, the exponential growth of the Hilbert space dimension uh, with the number of spins in the system. Uh, so, as you know, consequence, we, we really want exact solutions to these kinds of models. Um, so, they're invaluable, sort of helpful tools. Um, for one, they give a, a, a whole plethora of new phenomenology to help us understand intuitively what's going on in these systems. Um, and they can also be used as a starting point for perturbation theory in models which are not solvable, so interacting models or uh, models just outside of this uh, uh, exact solution formalism. And so a workhorse method for uh, you know, exact solutions to spin models is mapping to free fermions. So for example, if I have a one-dimensional uh, spin model like this, um, it's the 1D XY model, say, on nearest neighbor spin chain, um, then the kind of conventional way to solve this would be to use the Jordan-Wigner transformation. So the Jordan-Wigner transformation takes each term in this Hamiltonian and maps it to a quadratic in the Majorana raising and lowering operators. So these Majorana raising and lowering operators look like, in this case, these are ladder operators. They look like off-diagonal matrix elements together with a, a string of trailing Z pally operators, pally uh, Z string. And so these uh, operators satisfy the canonical anti-commutation relations for fermions. Um, and that's extremely useful because it maps this model, in this case, to a quadratic model, uh, and it proceeds by uh, doing this by term by term. So uh, it maps each term in this Hamiltonian to a term, a quadratic in these Majorana fermions. So once I've mapped this to a quadratic and I can diagonalize the exact single particle Hamiltonian, uh, I get a model which looks like this. Um, so these, these size are the canonical uh, eigenmodes of the, of the model, and these epsilon j's are the single particle energies. And for our purposes, we can think of these commutators as just being uh, zj pally operators. So they're kind of like commuting operators in some basis. Um, and uh, they, they just contribute a unit of energy of epsilon j. And so doing this yields the complete spectrum and eigenstates of the model. And from this, we can basically get almost anything we want. Um, so uh, in 2019, uh, Paul Fenley at the University of Oxford gave a, uh, an interesting model, which is uh, of this form. So it's a one dimensional spin chain, much like the previous one, uh, but it's three local. And um, it uh, has this sort of trailing Z uh, string in every term. So it's an XZ -Z -Z model. Um, and uh, surprisingly, oh well, okay. So the jordan Wigner transformation does not give a free fermion solution to this model. So if I straightforwardly apply that transformation, uh, this does not give me a quadratic model in fermions. Uh, and in fact, uh, in 2020, uh, Stephen Flamia and I proved a theorem, which uh, basically will imply that any generator to generator mapping of the form that I mentioned before is going to fail. So uh, there's actually no way to take each term in this Hamiltonian and map it to a quadratic in fermions that uh, gives a free fermion solution. Uh, but nevertheless, this model has a free fermion solution as shown by Paul Fenley. So uh, this paper is called Free Fermions in Disguise, and this is sort of the inspiration for this work. So uh, we were asking ourselves, you know, what's going on? Like, why is there a solution to this model that, that can't be captured this way? Um, so the tool that we used to prove our previous theorem for generator-generator mappings uh, is what's called the frustration graph. So given a Hamiltonian, uh, H written in a specific Pauli basis, uh, we define its frustration graph as a graph whose vertices correspond to the Pauli terms in the Hamiltonian, and vertices are neighboring only if the uh, Pauli terms anti-commute. 
Um, so, for example, uh, we can look at a single qubit. Uh, the frustration graph of any single qubit Hamiltonian is going to generally look like this. Uh, it's a click K3, so X, Y, and Z all mutually anti-commute. Um, and uh, we can see that, you know, maybe this is something we all already know, but uh, upon squaring uh, this Hamiltonian, the anti-commuting terms all mutually cancel each other out. So uh, we have this, this uh, self term where everything squares the identity. And then uh, we have these cross terms. And because everything here anti-commutes, the only thing that survives uh, is the, is the, uh, the self terms, so the squared terms. And so what this implies is that the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is plus or minus the square root of the sum of squares of the coefficients. Um, and so, you know, maybe we can convince ourselves that this argument will apply for an arbitrary click. Uh, so for any frustration graph, such as this six click here, uh, which is a click, uh, the Hamiltonian has a spectrum, which is plus minus the square root of the sum of squares of uh, the Hamiltonian coefficients. And so what's important here is that uh, the important observation is that the frustration graph by itself actually guarantees a property of the spectral structure. So just by looking at this graph, we actually know something about a spectrum regardless of the strengths of the coupling coefficients. And so that's sort of the uh, sort of motivating or like underlying philosophy of this work, which is that while we can make this graph more complicated um, and the spectral condition can become more complicated, this sort of uh, chain of implication continues to hold. So um, yeah, so while the graph and spectral structure can become more complicated, the story doesn't change. Um, so now I'll just tell you what the, the main result is in kind of an informal way. Uh, so we have a, a, a class of forbidden induced subgraphs. Uh, one of these is the claw, which is uh, a complete bipartite graph between one vertex and uh, three disjoint or three non-neighboring vertices, and uh, an infinite family of graphs called even holes. These are holes with uh, the only neighbors in the holes are the ones that uh, go in a cycle and they have even length. Um, so our main result, uh, which is theorem one and theorem two in the paper is that if a uh, Hamiltonian has an even whole claw free frustration graph, so these graphs do not appear as induced subgraphs of the frustration graph, um, then it has an explicit free fermion solution. And this free fermion solution is a, exactly of the form that uh, Paul Fenley gave in his 2019 paper. Um, and our result two, uh, which is kind of an interesting uh, corollary on the way to proving this result is that actually if the Hamiltonian frustration graph is only claw free, then there's a hierarchy of conserved commuting charges for the Hamiltonian. Um, so just to maybe continue with our earlier example, uh, let's consider the case where the Hamiltonian frustration graph is not a click. So here's a graph. Um, and uh, so what happens when we square it anyway, right? So we get this identity term again, sum of squares of single particle or of single uh, pallies. And then we get a contribution from everything that commuted because now not everything anti-commutes. So we have this commuting contribution. Um, and so we're going to collect all these commuting terms into an into a operator, which we call Q2. It's the sum of all commuting pallies, um, commuting pairs of pallies, I should say. And so we can actually generalize this to an arbitrary K. So what we're going to call the independent set charges is we're going to say, let uh, S sub K, script S sub K, be the collection of independent sets of K vertices in the frustration graph. And we're going to find Q sub K as the sum over all products of uh, K independent sets. Um, so I'll just say that one pretty nice thing about uh, this formalism, it allows you to coarse grain Hamiltonian terms in kind of a natural way. So um, what I'll call a product over operators in an independent set of the graph, I'll just label it by its independent set. And you can treat that set as a single vertex actually in a new frustration graph. And uh, the neighbors of that are the Z2 uh, sum of all the neighbors of the previous vertices in the set. So uh, this is the definition of this, of this thing called a uh, independent set charge. And it's the sum over all these independent products, independent set products. And so uh, what I called result two earlier uh, is what I'll just tell you about now. So uh, this is lemma one um, in the paper. So for a claw free frustration graph, the independent set charges themselves are mutually commuting. So before we could see that uh, Q2 commutes with the Hamiltonian because it's related by the simple uh, difference with the identity in the Hamiltonian squared, uh, but that's actually not true in general. So in general, uh, you need the promise of claw freeness uh, to see that actually all the independent set charges commute with each other. And since uh, Q1, by definition, is the Hamiltonian itself, these are all conserved. So I'll just uh, briefly sketch the proof. Um, so let's assume, because if R and S are equal, then this trivially is true. But uh, we take the commutator between unequal R and S, and we expand it by linearity. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll show that the non-vanishing terms in this commutator cancel pairwise. So if HS and HS prime anti-commute, 
um, then there's going to be another term uh, of two different independent sets that are going to uh, also cancel. And so the main insight behind this is that for a claw free graph, uh, the symmetric difference between independent sets S and S prime induces a bipartite graph of degree of most two. Uh, so it's a well-known property of claw free graphs. It's very important in graph theory. Um, and maybe you can believe it because if I have a vertex neighboring an independent set of size three or more, then that is a claw. So that induces a claw. So I can't have that ever happen. And it's bipartite because it's symmetric difference of two independent sets. Um, so I'll just describe the proof briefly here. So uh, this is a claw free graph. This is actually the frustration graph of Fenley's original model. And uh, you can see that the red vertices and the blue vertices are independent sets. Um, in this case, they induce a path of length five and there's six of them. Um, so it turns out that the, the commutation relation is the number of edges in a path. So if I commute the red through the blue, then I get, if there's odd many edges, then they anti-commute. Um, and what's going to happen is that I'm going to get a contribution from the red uh, independent set appearing in one uh, of these terms and the blue independent set appearing in the other. And I'm also going to have the same uh, term with those uh, associations switched. So blue is going to appear in the first independent set that I mentioned and red is going to appear in the other one. And because red and blue anti-commute, then there's going to be terms where everything is equal and they cancel pairwise. Um, so maybe you can now believe that uh, everything here cancels pairwise and uh, these actually do commute. All right. Uh, so the next ingredient we'll sort of need to state our uh, result more formally is that uh, is what's called the transfer operator. Um, so the transfer operator is you can think of it as a kind of uh, operator valued independence polynomial. So it's uh, an operator which is the sum of independent set charges with this uh, spectral factor or the spectral parameter raised to the power of u, uh, u raised to the power of j. Um, and I haven't said this before, but uh, q naught is the identity. So there's a constant term as well. Um, and so what's kind of interesting about this is that when uh, the frustration graph is even whole claw free, uh, these uh, transfer operators multiply, they have a, an inverse relationship. Uh, so the transfer operators multiply to this uh, polynomial and this actually is the vertex weighted independence polynomial of the original frustration graph. Um, so this is just, it's just a number and it's the sum of all uh, independent sets with coefficients uh, given by the product of the squared Hamiltonian coefficients. Um, so it's kind of an interesting property of these. And so what we do to, to provide the full proof uh, is we use this recursion relation. Um, so uh, for a given graph, a given, um, yeah, for a given graph, uh, because you can think of T as the sort of operator valued independence polynomial, removing a click from uh, this graph, uh, every vertex either belongs to this click or doesn't belong to the click, but no more than two vertices in a click can be a member of the same independent set. Um, so this breaks into uh, uh, two kind of collections of terms, one of which contains no vertices in the click, and the other contains exactly one vertex in the click, but none of the neighbors of that vertex. So, um, right. And so since all of the terms in a given, so all the factors in a given term of the Hamiltonian commute, uh, because they're all independent sets, I can pull that Hamiltonian term out of the front. And so this is a recursion relation that's satisfied by the, uh, the transfer operator. Um, so here's like kind of pictorial representation of that. Here's a, a kind of complicated looking graph, but here's kind of a colorful click uh, situated in the middle. And so we have a term which is given just by pulling the vertices of the click out. And then for each vertex in the click, we pull out that vertex and all of its neighbors, which includes the original click itself. And so this is a, a similar or an exact, uh, exactly the same recursion relation that's satisfied by the independence polynomial of the graph itself. Um, and so these, these recursion relations are very useful in graph theory and they've been used to prove a lot of uh, important theorems about the structures of these graphs. Uh, what I'll say in our proof is that um, we actually use the fact that uh, these recursion relations have the same structure. And so we can actually kind of use that to show that certain things are going to vanish. Okay, and so uh, the, I guess the next ingredient that I'll need uh, is what's called a simplical click. So a simplical click in a, in a graph um, is a non-empty click such that for every vertex in the click, uh, the neighborhood of that vertex induces a click uh, in the graph without the click itself. So, um, for example, this is this is a graph, and this this orange edge is a simple click. Um, it its neighborhood of each uh, vertex in this graph induces uh, a click that is outside the orange click. So, this is the the click whose neighborhood, uh, which is the neighborhood of this left vertex, and then there's similarly a click whose whose neighborhood, uh, similarly a, a click given by the neighborhood of this right vertex. And so we define an operator called the simple mode of Hamiltonian. 
And so Pali operator, which is not originally present in the Hamiltonian, but uh, anti-commutes with all of the operators in a simple click. So we have to introduce a kind of uh, a new mode or a new Hamiltonian operator. Uh, and it also squares the identity. Um, so uh, prior to this work, it actually wasn't known that every uh, even whole claw free graph contains a simple click. Um, and we originally needed this as a kind of third assumption that is disjoint to, uh, or, you know, we didn't know whether or not it was independent to the previous uh, two assumptions that the, the graph needs to be even whole claw free. Um, but when we asked uh, um, some graph theorists, so uh, Maria Chudnovsky, Paul Seymour, Alex Scott, and Sophie Spirkel, um, they also admitted they didn't know. And, and um, after a few days, they, they end up being able to show that it's true. And they actually wrote a very nice paper um, showing that it's actually true for a much more general class of graphs. So there's a forbidden subgraph characterization uh, for a class of claw free graphs that guarantees that uh, that that set of graphs will have a simple click. And um, it's kind of an interesting sort of story about how uh, investigations in physics can yield new mathematics. All right, so now that we have all the ingredients, uh, we can state the theorem uh, formally. So, so given a Hamiltonian, as I said, with an even whole claw free frustration graph with independence number alpha, uh, the, free, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is given by a free fermion spectrum, which is the sum of single particle energies. Um, it's this binary uh, signed sum of all the single particle energies. And the single particle energies themselves are given by the inverse roots uh, of the vertex weighted independence polynomial. So that polynomial um, ends up giving us the roots of the, of the uh, or sorry, the roots of that polynomial end up giving us the single particle energies. Um, and then our second theorem is that uh, the eigenmodes, which we can construct explicitly of the free fermion solution for the Hamiltonian are given by what we call the incognito modes because they're hidden. Um, so these are given by uh, conjugating the simple click, uh, simple click operator by the transfer matrix. Um, evaluated at the roots of the independence polynomial, so or the transfer matrix. So, um, right. So, conjugating this this simple mode by these transfer operators uh, gives this um, ladder operator. And so, uh, what we essentially show in the paper is that these ladder operators satisfy the canonical anti-commutation relations for fermions. They also um, satisfy the eigenmode condition. Um, and then we also have to take care to show that actually this is the complete spectrum for the model. Um, which we also do. And so our proof sort of closely follows the structure of Fenley's proof, and it's largely just a lot of algebra involving these recursion relations. Um, but indeed, we can, we can show this. And in fact, that also the uh, n sub j is a normalization factor, which is, which is computable. Okay, so, so once we have all this, uh, we can start to apply it to, to models. Um, so uh, we look at this class of models called uh, equipartition indifference, whose, whose uh, graphs we call equipartition indifference graphs. Uh, so in this case, this is a kind of generalization of Fenley's model, uh, where the, the number of uh, Zs in the, the trailing strings and the terms are you know, arbitrary. So in this case, this is the, uh, the case where each uh, term is four local. And uh, we see a periodicity of, we have a periodicity of size four on the coefficients. So that's something we impose to kind of impose a sort of coarse grain translation invariance. Um, and so using uh, some of the techniques of, of Fenley's paper, um, kind of adapted to our setting, uh, we can calculate a dispersion relation for this model. Um, so this is kind of the single particle energy uh, as a function of the, of the quasi momentum. Um, and uh, what's important is the critical exponent as this, uh, this curve approaches the, the boundary of the Brill one zone. So um, right at pi, uh, the critical exponent of this approach gives us kind of the critical exponents around phase transitions. So this is the, the phase diagram of the model. It has, it's parameterized by the squares of the coefficients uh, of the four local terms. And um, it's surprisingly symmetric about all four of those coefficients actually, even though it maybe doesn't look that way from this model to begin with. Um, so these, these red surfaces are the uh, phase transition points. Um, there's a tri-critical phase transition point on each uh, face of the tetrahedron. And there's also a quadruple critical phase transition point uh, in the center. And uh, here's cross sections through some of the faces or some of the uh, slices through the tetrahedron. Um, and uh, at the different tr uh, critical points, um, the model has different critical exponents. So, so uh, along the edges, the model reduces to kind of the 1DXY model criticality. Um, there's an exponent of, I believe, uh, one at the, um, at these tricritical points, and then I believe it's three halves at the, in the center. So this is a model that was actually looked at and fully generalized by these authors, Alcraz and Pimenta, um, in 2020, and, and these authors actually go a bit further 
and characterize this particular family of models for Q-dits um, and give a, a, a complete family characterization of the critical exponents as well. All right, so um, that's sort of the main uh, message of this paper. So uh, what I wanna say is that finding a mapping to free fermions is not necessarily obvious. There exists mappings that hold for all values of the coupling coefficients that take uh, the entire Hamiltonian uh, as given to you to an entire free fermion Hamiltonian. Um, and so we give a graph theoretic characterization. It's, I think it's very surprising that a graph theoretic characterization still applies for these uh, sort of non-local transformations. Um, and uh, what's also very interesting is that Fenley's model is actually already sort of defined in terms of interacting fermions. So it's called the four fermion model because um, yeah, if you apply the ordinary jordan Wigner transformation to it, it looks like interacting fermions. And so perhaps there are interacting fermion models that actually look like this that we aren't aware of. Um, and then I guess more generally, I think lessons from thinking about the exact solvability of these models might uh, teach us something about how to generalize to the non inscribable setting. Um, so that's all I have, and I wanna thank you for coming to the talk. Thank you very much. So come here, please, for questions to the mic. Hi, Adrian, thanks for the nice talk. So I have a question about the applicability of your results for 1D spin chains. Mm -hmm. Suppose I have a 1D nearest neighbor spin chain with a uh, you know, local field on each site mm -hmm. as well. So it seems like the frustration graph could have like a line and maybe some triangles from the, um, from the local field. Right. So does that uh, avoid your um, like graph theoretic so it depends on the uh, precise nature of the interactions. Um, I can say a few things. So uh, in our previous work, uh, we characterize uh, these kinds of models in terms of what are called line graphs. So uh, if that graph also has a line graph characterization, then a kind of Jordan Winger uh, solution will still work. Um, there actually is a structure theorem for even whole plot free graphs, um, which says that any even whole plot free graph basically decomposes into graphs which look like linear graphs in a way. Um, and uh, that sort of implies that the coarse topology of these graphs will be uh, either 1D or tree-like. Um, so it seems likely to me that, um, you know, for, a, for an arbitrary 1D model, these solutions might apply, but, um, you know, it's, it's also very easy to like make claws in these 1D models. So uh, yeah, it kind of depends specifically on the nature of those interactions. Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, QDIT generalization. So I was just wondering whether you can do that for pair of fermions or do you need more tools? Um, so you sort of need something that goes beyond, I guess, binary graph theory, because uh, at least in the anti-commuting commuting case, everything is either bi is a binary relation. Um, so you might consider uh, generalizing this to kind of like directed or weighted edges. Um, and so we thought about that a little bit. Um, and we think the same sort of method should apply, but there's some important details there. Uh, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. So I'm, I'm a bit of a novice when it comes to graph theory. So, so like how efficient is it? Like given, just given some Hamiltonian to like create this frustration graph and then go through and determine whether it is like even whole claw free. So that can all be done efficiently. Okay. Um, we're assuming also that the Hamiltonian is sparse in the sense that uh, the number of Hamiltonian terms is uh, polynomial in the number of qubits. So, um, so that can be done. So constructing the graph itself can be done efficiently. It turns out that for this particular class of graphs, recognizing them can also be done efficiently. Yeah, so that, that part is efficient. Hi, really nice talk, thanks. Um, so it, it looks to me as though when you, whatever class of free fermion models you find, uh, the, you're, you're always gonna be, you, you have sort of a constructive way of constructing a, a, a single complex fermion, right? right? So in that sense, you're identifying a mapping between your, the algebra of your poly operators and the algebra of like the full fermionic um, right. algebra, right? But it, for quadratic models, you only need the even fermionic algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, can you comment on whether maybe you could get some stronger constructions yeah. if you just, because so, you would be I looking at sort of a smaller, a you, you have a less restrictive mm -hmm. possibility essentially. Yeah, so um, I didn't say it, but uh, in the diagonal basis, what these independent set charges look like are symmetric polynomials in the Zs that I mentioned on the first slide. 
Um, so they're all products of subsets of Zs with, with the energy weightings. Um, so the, the largest one of these, the Q alpha, actually looks like what you might think of as a parity operator. Um, so you simply need to restrict in your free fermion mapping to the even parity subspace of that operator, and uh, that will give you what you want. So there's you do get a little bit more, but then you can just restrict back onto it and you divide the dimension by half. Okay. Maybe I can chat more. Okay. We have time, um, I just want to follow up on the, the question just before Joel's about efficiency, right? So, I mean, in your talk, the independence number popped up, and that's normally a very difficult quantity to compute. So, what does that say about using your framework in general? Yeah, so what I didn't say is, uh, so I mentioned that this um, independent set symmetric difference um, is uh, very important for Clawford graphs. So, that actually allows you to calculate the independence number for Clawford graphs efficiently. Yeah, so that's what you can do. Hi, a question online from Ian Lim. Mm -hmm. Is there anything interesting about the opposite mapping from fermions to spins? For instance, bosonization in 2D can map interacting fermions to free bosons. Yeah, so we haven't thought about that too much in these particular class of models. In the previous uh, work, we thought about um, how to map uh, line, so models whose algebra satisfy line graphs um, to, to bosons. And essentially what you need to do is you need to find a binary uh, covering, I guess, of the edges in the graph um, to, to realize all the commutation relations explicitly. Um, so in this case, um, it depends, I guess, on the properties that you want from the model. But um, you know, uh, ideally, you can you can construct like whatever um, free fermion model you want. But but maybe getting some properties is difficult. Depends on what you want, I think. Okay, so let's thank Adrian for the nice talk and the answers to those nice questions. Okay, and now a couple of minutes until the next.